Oh, good evening, all. I was going to say ladies and gentlemen, but I think we're all male today. Tonight, um, the evening lecture presented, of course, as usual, by the Heritage Society of Engineers Island. But I'd particularly like to welcome any any visitors here this evening. Um, I must have, first of all, just draw your attention to the emergency exits in the very unlikely um, unlikely event that uh, the, uh, um, the lecture might uh, generate some fire or something. But anyway, <laughs> the door you came in and the emergency exit in the right hand side of the lecture theatre. Now our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Harmon Murta, um, is currently the president of the Military History Society of Ireland, and he's a visiting fellow and a former senior lecturer at Athlone Institute of Technology. Uh, but he's also the author of numerous historiographical publications, and he's currently working on a study of the um, Irish Jacobite army. So we look forward to a book on that subject at some stage. He tells me that this may be his last lecture because he needs to concentrate on, on writing the book. So we're very privileged to have him as a speaker tonight. Um, his lecture will cover the development of the power and effects of smoothbore artillery and warfare, particularly its use in Ireland from the time of the Armada up to around about 1800. So it gives me much pleasure to invite Dr. Murta to present his lecture, which he has entitled Ultimate Strength Artillery in Ireland from the Armada to 1800. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be in this wonderful building, and this marvellous lecture hall. I'd like to claim uh, a small connection, if I may, with the Institute of Engineers, in that my uncle, who became an engineer in Trinity in 1943, and then joined the British Army as an engineer, and then after the war returned to Ireland, was for a time your honorary treasurer, or perhaps joint honorary treasurer. He's still alive at the advanced age of 94 uh, and, and going strong. Also, I, do you publish the journal Engineers Ireland? Yes? Yes, well, I have contributed at least twice to the, that fine journal, I must say. Um, so, um, so there you go. <laughs> well, uh, let's see what we, what we have to say about this. Um, <clears throat> go on to the first slide. This is a magnificent 24-pounder, a gun of about 1690, from the artillery of King Louis XIV of France. Most guns were of iron, but this one is bronze. And so this splendid Baroque decoration remains as sharp as when it was cast 300 years ago. The decoration includes several inscriptions, amongst them the motto Ultima Ratio Regum, the final argument of kings. As Louis XIV famously regarded himself as the state, we might equally today say that on artillery ultimately rests the authority of the state. Certainly this was the view of the provisional government in the new Irish state of 1922, when it deployed a pair of 18-pounder field guns borrowed from the departing British Army to overcome and eject the Four Courts garrison uh, that had defied its authority. Uh, Louis XIV, or probably Napoleon, uh, who was a great artillerist and perhaps the greatest of all, would have understood. And the physical damage that artillery is capable of inflicting uh, is well reflected uh, in uh, this picture of the four courts under fire from two field guns. And the impact of artillery on personnel, I think, is shown in the, the following picture, this one of a shocked and blood-stained member of the Four Courts garrison being escorted by a Free State soldier uh, to a waiting to a waiting ambulance. You can see it hasn't done him uh, any good. The word artillery, the term, uh, the word artillery comes from the Latin ars tellorum, uh, the art of launching darts. Uh, thus, it affords a means of fighting uh, at a distance. 
the development of gunpowder in the uh, Middle Ages saw dart throwing catapults and other primitive forms of artillery gradually replaced by metal cannon. These were in existence in Europe in the 14th century when they were known in I Italy and France and they were deployed at Crecy in 1346 by the English where Edward III had well at least three and at most five uh, guns uh, on the field. But apart from noise and smoke, early artillery would have had little impact on a battlefield, but it was increasingly important in siege warfare. Here, artillery is being used at the Siege of Rouen by King Henry V in 1418. And it's of interest that, uh, if you saw the full illustration, uh, the city deployed an even larger number of guns in its defence than Henry could deploy uh, in its attack. The earliest reference to artillery in Ireland is in 1361, when Lionel Duke of Clarence, he was the King Edward III's son, younger son, was provided with one very small gun for his expedition to Ireland. In 1394, King Richard II was accompanied by six large and six small cannon on the first of his two Irish expeditions. He left a stock of cannon in Dublin Castle after his second expedition in 1399. The first time cannon are known to have destroyed a fortress in Ireland was in 1488, when the Earl of Kildare deployed ordnance, it's organish in the Irish annals, to destroy Balrath Castle uh, in County West Mead. I've been to Balrath Castle, which is a sort of in a farmyard, when I couldn't no, it's a ruin, of course, the rubble, uh, but I couldn't uh, particularly notice any, any, gun, any, gun, any gun marks on it. Um, more well-known and a good example of Ultima Ratio Regum is the bombardment of Maynooth Castle uh, uh, by Sir William Skeffington in 1535. Uh, and the bombardment lasted a week. And the castle itself was defended by artillery, served by 60 gunners that the, uh, that the, uh, the, the Fitzgeralds of Kildare uh, had in their employment. The successful bombardment effectively ended the revolt of Silken Thomas against the crown. And it was, in Professor Hayes McCoy's words, a demonstration of power and prestige and a presage of further use of force that stirred uh, all Ireland. And the earliest Irish illustration of a gun is from a Kilkenny deed of about the same time, 1543 to be precise. And the lease is to one Martin Potterchello, who is described in the document as a gunner. So his gun uh, uh, gets, into the, uh, gets into the picture. You can see it there on the top. This is Burt Castle, County Donegal, the, the chief stronghold of O'Doherty, uh, about 1600. Irish chieftains, those that were still kings in their own territory, also understood the importance of artillery. The O'Donnells used a gun to take Sligo as early as 1515, and in 1555, Calvac O'Donnell obtained a gun for breaking walls from the Earl of Argyll. Scotland, and with it he demolished the castles of Greencastle and Annach, which is probably Inch uh, in Turconnell, in what is now uh, Donegal. But while the psychological impact of the government's artillery was great, its practical application in Ireland was rather limited. At the Battle of the Yellow Ford, which is pictured here in 1598, the English had four guns. The largest, a saker, that's to say a gun fired that fired a five or six pound shot. Uh, and it weighed the best part of a ton. And as they made their way across the watery uh, land of Ulster, uh, the saker kept sinking into the boggy ground. That's it, you see, uh, in the middle of our, of our, oh, sorry, in the middle of our, uh, of our picture there. Well, you can see it better than I can uh, at this, uh, at this, at this angle. And um, eventually, uh, its wheel broke, and the, of course, the, the English army was defeated and had to retreat and abandoned uh, their, their saker, which proved to be uh, no use to them anyway. Uh, 
Moving heavy guns that were suitable for breaking down walls, and I'll explain about that later on, but moving these through the watery Irish countryside was very difficult in the absence of adequate roads. Uh, and the English tried to move their guns uh, by sea, uh, if, uh, if possible. Armies marched at the speed of their artillery train, which enjoyed right of way because it was huge and cumbersome uh, and moving slowly. So right away to the artillery train over everybody else. When William III in 1690 left his train behind to follow on behind his army, he lost it to the Irish cavalry uh, at Ballyneeshie when Sarsfield made his famous cavalry raid. A small number of very light 16th century breech loading guns found in Ireland survive in the collection of the National Museum and are on display uh, in, their, uh, in their Kildare Street branch. But much the finest canon of this period in Irish museums are the magnificent bronze weapons recovered by underwater archaeologists from the Armada wrecks Corona, La Trinidad, Valencera and Juliana. Here is a bronze 50-pounder from La Trinidad, Valencera being lowered into a conservation bath. Well, it was described as a 50-pounder, but I actually doubt that it is uh, as anything like that. Uh, that it, you know, it didn't fire a 50-pound projectile. It looks more like it might have fired a 12-pound or so. Anyway, the Armada was intended to ferry the Spanish army of the Duke of Parma in Flanders across the North Sea for an invasion of England. And so the ships carried not only their own cannon, but also siege cannon such as this for the English campaign. The recovered Armada cannon are on display in the Ulster Museum, Belfast, and also in the National Museum uh, in Dublin. They were hundreds of years under the Atlantic, but they were cast in bronze, and they look as though they were made last week. Fantastic survivor under the sea uh, bronze. Um, now, artillery falls into two types really field artillery and siege artillery this is uh, theodore mace's engraving uh, of the battle of the boy he was an eyewitness and he was there and he uh, depicts the battle in a famous picture picture and uh, which but also he did a wonderful uh, engraving of it and a corner of it very prominent in it indeed are the williamite field guns and field here they are firing guns of 1690 or so and field artillery uh, was used useful in open battle uh, where heavier guns such as 12 pounders could be deployed in batteries to cover weaker sections of the line but they were so heavy and cumbersome that they couldn't really be moved about. So that you might just station them in one place and certainly you wouldn't be deploying anything bigger than 12 pounders on a battlefield, but mostly there are much lighter guns, such as three pounders, which could, that's to say they fired a cannonball of three pounds uh, weight. Uh, and they were easily, much more easily maneuvered to fill the gaps between the infantry battalions or even placed in front of the battalions uh, to give them close support with case shot. That's rather like, uh, and we talk about it later on, but rather like an enlarged shotgun effect, which is, you know, bad news for attacking cavalry or infantry. <clears throat> and some armies adopted the idea of having a couple of cannon with each infantry battalion. Uh, they also had a superior range to muskets. Um, matchlock or flintlock smoothbore muskets had an effective range of about 100 meters. After that, they, uh, they lost velocity so quickly that it was, had the same effect as being hit by a stone rather than a, you know, a, a, a slug that would do you in. Well, the artillery had a much longer range, something over 600 meters and maybe as much as a thousand meters effective range. And the thing is, while a cannonball couldn't kill that many people, you know, one shot wasn't going to kill that many people, it was jolly unnerving for an infantry battalion or indeed a cavalry troop to be standing on the battlefield and the next thing there's a whiz 
and the three guys in the file beside you or the six guys in the file beside you all lose their heads you start to say well okay we've only lost six but <clears throat> the next one might be coming in my direction so it, it you know it was very it, it wasn't that it killed that many but it was very demoralizing uh, 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 effect on 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 infantry standing on the battlefield especially and all over Europe uh, the number of guns actually was going up from the 16th century onwards. This is just, I just picked out some, battle, some battles at random. Sarasoli in 1543, 20 guns, you see. Roqua in 1643, still 20 guns. Enzyme in 1674, uh, 30. Landon or um, um, it's got uh, near Winden is the proper name for it. Uh, it's 71 guns. Malplaquet 60 guns. Waterloo 246 guns deployed by uh, Napoleon. And of course the armies were growing in size as well. So the table on the right there gives the uh, gives the the ratio per per thousand. You see. So it varies quite a bit, but it's very high by the time uh, you get to you get to uh, to Waterloo. <clears throat> and in Ireland, you can see the same tendency. In 1601 at Kinsale, neither side had any artillery. In 1646 at Benburb, Owen Roe O'Neill had no cannon. We still won the battle. Whereas his, we call them English, they were actually Scottish opponents. They had 16 guns but didn't do them any good. At the Boyne in 1690, the Irish had 16 guns, maybe 17, but 16. And the English, uh, it was an international army, uh, but they had 46 field guns. Uh, they had about 40 field cannon and half a dozen, half a dozen howitzers. And at Vinegar Hill in 1798, well, this was a, you know, a more amateurish affair, but the rebels insurgents managed to put up five guns, which they'd captured earlier on, and the English, who were also mostly Irish, <laughs> on the other side, on the loyalist side, they had, they had, uh, they had 20 guns. But there's, you can see there's a, a more or less uh, a, move, uh, a move up. So what was it like? Uh, on the battlefield with these cannonballs whizzing around. Well, at the Battle of Newbury in the English Civil War in 1643, uh, a guy, an eyewitness said, a whole file of our men, six deep, with their heads struck off with one cannon shot of ours. So uh, the way armies formed up was in ranks across and in files deep, you see. So this is a cannonball that came in and the file was six deep and brrr, knocked off the six heads. But when you get down to it, it was only six men, you know, but it's very unnerving for the other chaps. And at the Battle of Ross in Ireland about the same period, 1647, a contemporary wrote, I did see what terrible work the ordnance had made. What goodly men and horses lay there all torn, and their guts lying on the ground, <laughs> arms cast away, and strewn all over the field. So not very nice being hit by a cannonball, as if you hadn't uh, guessed that already. Uh, yeah. Wait, no, we've done jumped a bit there. Yes. Uh, the it, it, Italian uh, political philosopher, uh, Machiavelli wrote in 1490, turning now to siege artillery, uh, he wrote in 1490, No wall, he said, now exists, however thick, that artillery cannot destroy in a few days. And this shows siege artillery firing through the embrasures in a battery, oh, about 1743 um, in the 18th century. But for siege work, very heavy guns, 24, 36, and even 64 pounders were deployed. That's to say they fired an iron shot that was 64 pounds weight or 36 pounds weight or 24 pounds weight. And these fired, you see, at close range against the wall of a fortification. And a shot from one of those could penetrate as much as 35 feet 
into a solid, stone-faced and earth-backed fortification. At sea, a 24-pounder could penetrate up to four and a half feet of seasoned oak. Up to four and a half feet of seasoned oak. So they packed a tremendous punch, these heavy, uh, these heavy guns. Now, all smoothbore artillery, the they, they, they projectile loses velocity as soon as it starts leaving the barrel. So the trick is, if you really want to make a, a punch, a hole in the guy's wall or in his ship, is to get in good and close. Uh, so that you have the full uh, benefit of the uh, velocity uh, of it, uh, you know, of leaving the barrier as near as near as possible. And when it came to siege artillery uh, uh, and its use in Ireland, um, the number of battering pieces as siege guns were called. Well, in 1649, Cromwell brought the biggest train up to then ever seen in Ireland, and he went round with 11 guns. And he made short work of the Irish fortifications, capturing city after city or town after town, as you know. In 1689, the Jacobites besieged Derry, but they could only muster, it's an awful long way to Derry, and they could only muster two uh, siege cannon and one heavy mortar. And therefore, not surprisingly, they didn't. They weren't very well served, and so on. But they didn't succeed in taking uh, the city. William uh, of Orange, when he came to Ireland in 1690, he brought a large artillery train, but it was mostly field guns and howitzer. He did six howitzers, as I mentioned, and about 40 field guns. He'd only eight heavy guns. And these he left, they were slow moving across the Irish countryside. And so when they were blown up at Ballymeaty, there were eight guns involved there. Actually, only two of them were shattered beyond repair. Uh, six of them were repaired, but what he lost was his powder, and that inhibited his subsequent uh, siege of Limerick and enabled the Jacobites to resist him. And just to give you an idea of uh, what, were, in fact, the following year, because he'd had those difficulties, William sent to Ireland a, large, a larger train of very heavy guns. Uh, I'll mention them a bit further on. Marlborough, the great Duke of Marlborough, he fought four famous battles, but he conducted more than a hundred sieges. And his artillery train in Europe, and I think including field guns and battering guns, you know, was a hundred guns and mortars. And the train of ammunition and paraphernalia, spare parts and all that went with them, required 3,000 wagons. And the 3,000 wagons and the 100 guns needed 16,000 horses to move them along, uh, to move them along the roads uh, on the continent. Incredible. And they, on a good day, they might do 12 or 14 meters, uh, kilometers on a good day. But if, you know, a wheel broke on a big gun on a narrow road, the whole show, uh, the whole show was held up. Um, what was it like to be in a siege? Well, this picture depicts mortar bombs uh, landing in a city at night. Now, mortar bombs didn't destroy the fortifications, but if you prime them properly and you cut the fuse to the right length and you got your act together, they would burst uh, above the city uh, just as they were, you know, coming in. And uh, they might set fire to houses, uh, but they terrified the garrison and they terrified uh, the population. The, the Siege of Athlone in 1691 was the heaviest bombardment in Irish history before the 20th century. And Captain John Stevens was a Jacobite officer there. And this is what he said. So he's on the receiving end. The enemy, meanwhile, bent 30 pieces of cannon and all their mortars that way. So that what with the fire and what with the balls and bombs flying so thick, that spot was a mere hell upon earth, for the place was very narrow, which made the fire scorch. And so many cannon and mortars incessantly playing on it, there seemed to be no likelihood of any man coming off alive. And, <coughs> and this, I think, was the hottest place that I ever saw in my time of service. Besides the bombs, the enemy threw out of their mortars a vast quantity of stones. 
Besides that, the place being so close, the cannonballs which struck the castle walls beat off abundance of stones from them, which did as much mischief as the others. I was not down with a stone that flew from the castle wall, which only stunned me. A good stout beaver hat I had on, saving my head. And so he lived uh, to, tell, uh, to tell the tale. Siege artillery gave aggressive, offensive warfare an initial advantage, as Machiavelli had observed. Medieval fortifications became obsolete. The response to the new threat was the development of new fortifications by a new profession of competent military engineers. The new system was called the Trace Italien, the Italian Trace, because it was invented in Italy in the 16th century. And it comprised low-level fortresses, purpose-built to, to a geometric plan with walls backed by ramparts of earth that mounted, they all mounted cannon, and the walls, the fortifications were fronted by elaborate uh, outworks. Charles Fort Kinsale, built in the 1660s, is the best example of an Irish artillery fortress of the new type. But it's not as originally conceived. Actually, what you see there is an, an immense fortress, but it was intended only as an outwork of the fortress as conceived. If you go to Kinsale, you'll notice that Charles Fort is down in a bit of a hollow. The fortress as conceived was meant to cover all of the high ground above that. So it would have been many multiples in size of what was built. Uh, um, the government, as usual, said, mm, uh, we can't really afford that. We will begin with the outwork. And that's all that was, uh, that was ever built. Uh, the basic plan of what you see there is polygonal with arrow-headed pentagonal bastions at each, uh, at each uh, salient. Um, these are the bastions and they're absolutely characteristic of uh, the Tres Italien, you see. And uh, they're on each of, the, each, of, each of the salient. The bastions provided the guns with an all-round range of fire out into the country, along the face of the curtain wall, along the adjoining bastions, and back onto the ramparts. Each bastion supported the next, so that not a meter of dead ground remained outside the effective range of the cannon. 17th century warfare was much more about methodically conducted sieges and related maneuvers than it was about open battles, which were messy, ill-managed, and unpredictable slogging matches. Whereas with the siege, a great engineer like the uh, Marshal Vauban, Louis XIV's military engineer, could tell you virtually to the day how long it would take him to capture a particular fortress. He, he, it was all mathematically, mathematically worked out. How long would it take to build the trenches and move the guns in close to the walls, blow a hole in the, in the, uh, in the bastions, in the nose of the bastion, and then uh, launch your assault and so on. Um, the use of artillery also transformed warfare at sea, where armed merchantmen were replaced by purpose-built ships of war in growing numbers. In France, for example, um, uh, when um, uh, Louis XIV came to power in 1660, uh, they had 12 warships. By 1688, uh, under the aegis of his great uh, finance minister, uh, Gulbert, the number had risen to 189. Warships with increasing numbers of cannon became floating artillery fortresses. And it was the combination of new navies and artillery fortresses that gave European maritime power its worldwide military and economic, uh, and economic uh, dominance. And the warship size increased, and so did the number of guns employed. 
the <clears throat> Trinidad Valencia that we mentioned earlier on and the Spanish Armada had 42 guns, probably many of them fairly light caliber. The Vasa, which was the Swedish um, uh, flagship that was launched in Stockholm in 1628 and promptly capsized and sank, she had 64 guns. The pride of the English Navy in 1664, the Royal Oak, had uh, uh, 90 guns. And uh, to give you an idea of the size of fleets, the Dutch fleet, uh, Holland, uh, the especially literally Holland around the city of Amsterdam, was, you know, the sort of Singapore slash New York slash Hong Kong uh, of uh, the 17th century. And the Dutch depended on trade and so to protect their trade routes and so on, they had uh, an enormous navy. 103 full phase warships and 30 fire ships, crewed by 22,000 sailors and armed with 5,000 guns. So if you want to go on the Dutch, you want to be serious about it. Uh, the picture shows on the left. Admiral de Reuters, the great Dutch admiral, his 80 gun Seven Provincien, the Seven Provinces, at the Four Days Battle against the English in 1666. And uh, that's his, uh, her, his ship. And the boat in the foreground is the 60 gun Swiftsure, which has had a bad time from the Seven Provinces and is about to, uh, to strike her, her, uh, her, her colors. So these are the floating artillery fortresses. Uh, they had an impact on Ireland. Um, immediately, the English began to develop warships. It impacted on control of the North Shannon, uh, uh, Channel uh, between Northern Ireland and Scotland. This had been dominated by the Macdonald galleys because the Macdonalds were settled in the west of Scotland and also uh, in County Antrim. But when the proper English warships were developed, they swept the Macdonald galleys out of it and took control of the, of the North Channel. That was followed by the Spanish Armada. Of course, it didn't directly attack Ireland, but in the event, and is making its way home around the north coast of Scotland and the west, uh, western Atlantic, it ran into a storm and about 26 of the Armada ships were wrecked off the coast of Ireland. Uh, um, so, you know, we felt the impact of it. Subsequently, just after 1600, the Spanish sent an expedition on board their fleet, or part of their fleet, at to Kinsale, which resulted in the Battle of Kinsale. During the Confederate period on the 1640s, the Confederates set up, you know, a sort of Catholic government in Kilkenny, and uh, they, had a they had their armies in each of the four provinces, but they had a navy as well. And the navy operated from Wexford, and it had some of the finest ships in Europe, because what they did was they uh, brought in uh, French, very fast French frigates from Dunkirk, and they gave these guys letters of mark. That's to say they turned them from pirates to privateers. And they raided English shipping uh, very severely on the, on the Western approaches. And finally, uh, when the Jacobite War came along, which involved Louis XIV uh, at the end, towards the end of the 17th century, uh, Louis, Louis had the, a magnificent navy, as we've seen, built up by Colbert, and he sent eight fleets to Ireland uh, during the war. And the English Navy only managed to intercept one, and that was at Bantry Bay uh, in, in 1689, May 1st of May 1689, when, and that's what this picture on the left here depicts. And there at the battle, 24 French warships uh, took on 22 English warships. And they pounded away at each other's rigging in ba just at the mouth of Bantry Bay uh, for most part of a day. And no ships were sunk, but eventually the French had unloaded their, done their business, unloaded their supplies and men, and they eventually sailed out and sailed home. 
It was this propaganda that one of the French ships had been burned. That's supposed to be her flaming in the background. But in fact, there was a small fire on board her and it was put out and she sailed, uh, she set successfully uh, s s sailed home. It's actually hardly anybody knows about it, was the biggest naval battle ever fought in Irish waters to this day. Uh, and later on, uh, in, at, the, at the end of the 18th century, in 1796 to 1798, uh, the French made further uh, attempts to land in Ireland, and uh, especially in 1796, they sent 17 full ships of the line, 13 frigates, and uh, 14 transport vessels, again, uh, to Bantry Bay. But uh, it was the middle of winter, and the storm dispersed the fleet, and they never landed, and that was that. Um, so, uh, so, you know, the expansion of navies and so on, and the new firepower of navies did have uh, an impact uh, in Ireland uh, in Ireland as well. It's argued that artillery caused a revolution in warfare and in turn radically altered and modernized uh, government. There's much debate about this issue and many refinements of the arguments in it. But in simple terms, the proposition can be stated as follows. The introduction of gunpowder at first made war cheaper and strengthened the offensive on both land and sea. This forced rulers to build expensive artillery fortresses for greater security and to develop fleets of warships with heavy guns as floating fortresses. Defenders needed larger armies to man these fortresses and the ships and attackers likewise to attack them. At first, the new manpower was largely supplied by military contractors. But after the uh, experiences of the Thirty Years' War in Europe in the early 17th century, rulers preferred to raise and control these armies themselves. And to keep their military strength in being, at least to some extent in peacetime, they developed the concept of having standing armies, the sort of army we have in Ireland to this day. This, in turn, required the development of bureaucracies to administer the new forces and to raise the taxation necessary for their support. From these developments sprang modern government. That is the theory of the military revolution. It's uh, debated, but uh, probably there's a lot of truth in it. <clears throat> uh, well, some technology. Uh, this is uh, a, the cannon I showed you uh, at the uh, beginning of the, the lecture, the Louis XIV's uh, gun. And uh, the parts of the gun had different uh, names. Uh, you can see, uh, I don't know whether, up here is the, the muzzle. Oh, I'm looking at the right hand, bad angle here. Up there is the muzzle. And you call this part then the chase, coming down from the muzzle. Then the trunnions, uh, which uh, the gun sits on slots in its gun carriage on the trunnions. And then after the trunnions, if they're, you can see them there, I, don't, I just can't from this angle. Anyway, are the dolphins, yes, here they are, the dolphins, uh, which are exactly at the point of balance. And they're used for lifting the gun onto its carriage or lifting it off, off the carriage if, say, the wheel broke and you need to put it on a, a new on a new carriage. And then there are various reinforcing rings at different points uh, to keep uh, to keep the gun uh, intact, I suppose. And then finally, you come back to the vent, which is somewhere here, and the cascable, and ultimately uh, the uh, th that's that's uh, that that's it. So these are the various parts. And then the bore is, of course, the hole down the interior of the cannon, going back up till you get to the uh, to the uh, to the breech. Um, uh, just move on one now. Uh, such guns were of iron or bronze. Uh, sometimes they're called brass guns, but I think they may mean bronze. There's a slight difference. You know, um, bronze is a, an alloy of copper and tin, 
whereas brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. But those were the basic mixtures. But they put in other uh, other metals, uh, you know, uh, as well, uh, magnesium and things like that. Um, you guys are the engineers. I don't really understand those things. But uh, the iron and bronze are the basic ones. And they had to be mounted on gun carriages to fire. Depending on which the use which these guns were put, the carriages were of different types. Guns that were moved around had carriages with long trails. Uh, this is the, the trail part here, you see. And this is a gun that's been moved around in the rain. Uh, um, and the large spoked wheels with a two-wheeled limber. And this is the limber up here. And this turned the gun into a four-wheeler for ease of movement. And you needed that. A six-pounder gun, which wasn't all that big, weighed a ton. And an 18-pounder weighed two tons or more. Well, when you wanted to fire a gun like that, you detached it from the trail. And then it was a two-wheeler. And here's your, and then here's your train. Um, Naval guns were mounted on four small wheels to absorb the shock of the recoil without damaging the ship. This is the gun deck of the Swedish ship Vasa, and the gun carriages are there as they were the day she turned over. The guns themselves too heavy to leave on board, so they have been taken off. But it gives a good sense of the gun deck on an early 17th century uh, a warship. And they are on four wheels. And then when the gun is fired, uh, she, um, she recoils. Uh, and there's not too much of a jerk, uh, which would, you know, damage, possibly damage the, uh, the ship. And then she's reloaded and then pushed back. And we'll talk about the loading later on. And then pushed back with the barrel uh, sticking out the side of the ship again. <clears throat> and sometimes fortress carriages... Uh, where uh, of of the, the previous types that I've shown, but ideally a block carriage uh, was most uh, was most uh, useful. Um, this picture shows the Derry guns on the walls of Derry, which have been uh, reconstructed. Uh, well, the guns themselves have been refurbished, and then the carriages are new, uh, reconstructed block carriages. That's to say, they have wheels on the front part, but they have a sort of slide on the back part here. And that meant <clears throat> when the gun was fired and recoiled, you know, she wouldn't, this would slow her down. She wouldn't slide too far back and perhaps disappear off the, uh, off the part of it altogether. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's the, the that, it's not a, not everybody is convinced that those guns in Derry would have been like that, but it seems that pretty, pretty, pretty plausible. Uh, thing. Um, early guns were once-off pieces of manufacture, and they tended to be given personal names, such as those of saints or kings. And this practice continued up to at least the end of the 17th century. The Louis XIV gun that I showed you, for example, has its name L'Envier, the envied one, inscribed on the barrel. The gun in this picture is the most famous named gun in Ireland. It was presented to Derry by the London Fishmongers Company in 1642. And certainly by the end of the 17th century, it was known as Roaring Meg, presumably because it made a good bang when it was fired. Uh, it's mounted here on a very inappropriate 19th century ship's carriage. But you'll be glad to know that with the other Derry guns, it has been remounted and is much uh, sexier looking uh, today. For much of the 16th and 17th centuries, guns were classified into different types by their approximate size. According to a curious table, with titles mostly taken from birds of prey. Thus, a robinet uh, weighed about 300 pounds and fired a one pound shot. A falcon weighed about four to 500 pounds and uh, fired, uh, yes, and fired a two and a half pound shot. Then you have a minion firing a four pound shot, a saker, that's a 
type of falcon, uh, firing a five or six pound shot, a culverine firing an 18 pound shot, the demi cannon firing a 30 pound shot, and the cannon firing a 60 pound shot. Yeah, the sizes were approximate, they're all once off pieces. No two perhaps were exactly the same, so uh, you know uh, the, the 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 sizes are are approximate. One man's uh, saker might be you know another man's minion, uh, and even the uh, weight the pound in France uh, was heavier than the pound in somewhat heavier than the pound in England. So it's quite difficult to trace your way trace your way through it and there were many subdivisions indeed uh, apart from the main ones i mentioned there but by the uh, end of the 17th century guns were becoming more standardized and increasingly people weren't using words like culverin and saker uh, they were using four pounder eight pounder and so on uh, uh, related to the size and the weight, rather, of the cannonball it was a solid iron ball that the uh, that the gun could uh, that the gun could take had uh, caliber enough to take. Some other gun, some other things worth mentioning, names worth mentioning are a cannon. A cannon is an artillery piece designed to fire point blank. That doesn't mean up close, as you engineers know. Uh, it means that it fired at an elevation parallel to the ground. That's its basic sticks like that. Now, you could elevate it. That's fine. But its basic firing method was put the barrel parallel to the ground. And they were accurate at about 600 meters. Uh, if you elevated the gun, you could get as much as 5,000 meters out of it, depending on it being fine weather and the powder being good quality and the cannonball, you know, being a fairly close fit and things like factor factors like that. But with no accuracy, with no degree of accuracy. Uh, the howitzer is a short artillery piece firing projectiles frequently explosive ones, they, they you know, would explode, uh, at an angle of about 15 degrees. Uh, the first and I think the only time they were used in anger in Ireland was at the Battle of the Boyne, when, as I said, King William had six howitzers uh, that uh, he brought uh, from, uh, that were sent from Amsterdam. They had a maximum range of about 1,200 metres, but not very, uh, not very accurate. And the mortar. The mortar is a short barrel siege weapon fired at a high angle and designed to lob bombs or even stones across the walls of a fortress. Uh, so here they are, you see. Uh, I'll just show you this because it's rather amusing. Uh, first of all, you put your powder in. Then you put in your bomb, which is a, a hollow uh, iron uh, ball uh, filled with gunpowder and with a hole at one end into which you, there was a fuse. Then you lit your fuse and then you proceeded to fire your mortar by applying a, 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 a flame or a link stock to the touch hole here. Now, fine, the mortar fired and if your fuse was the right length, your bomb went up and it just burst. That fuse burned out and just burst nicely over the city, causing much difficulty. But imagine the situation where you light the fuse and you say, mm, it's about right now, and you apply your linstock to the touch hole and nothing happens. Uh, then it's time to get to hell out of there because the mortar is going to burst in your face. And this one you'll be interested in. Uh, this is a petard, or a petardo. Uh, Hamlet says, For tis sport to have the engineer hoist on his own petard. And uh, what a petard was, was that you, you had a curious uh, machine with a, which went forward on wheels with a thing like a bucket at the end. And that was full of explosives. And your engine, they, you got it, the idea was it was meant to blow open the gates of a fortress. And you got it in close against the gates of the fortress, a hazardous operation in itself. And then the engineer came forward 
and he lit the fuse for the petard and then he got the hell out of it. Now if he tripped or if he was a slow mover, if the pedarthritic, or if uh, he was maybe wounded by a shot from the wall, or if the fuse burnt more quickly than he expected, he was hoist on his own petard. Because if an enormous explosion, the gate would be blown open and the engineer would be blown up if he hadn't gotten uh, to, uh, to, hell, to hell out of there. So hence the phrase, which is widely used, hoist on your own petard. And it should be particularly application to engineers. But it's, it's still widely, widely used. Uh, it comes from Shakespeare, the hoist on your own petard bit. But that's what he was, uh, that's what he was, uh, what he was getting at. Uh, a galloper. This is, this is another type of gun. This was the forerunner of modern field, or of mobile field artillery. The slow movement of cannon uh, posed a dilemma for armies on a battlefield. Gustavus Adolphus, the great 17th century warrior king of Sweden, was one of the first to try and develop light mobile field artillery. And he made his light field artillery by making a copper, taking a copper tube uh, and binding it tightly with leather and then in turn binding the leather with rope. And this could get off a small number of shots, believe it or not, before it disintegrated. Such guns were known in Scotland and on one celebrated occasion in Ireland. This is when Viscount Galmoy attempted to take Crum Castle in Fermanagh in 1689. And he had his chaps make two uh, leather bound, two tin guns, uh, then with leather and then bound with rope. And you see, you could move them easily across the sort of watery hinterland in, in Fermanagh. And they were brought up to Crum anyway, and the gunner attempted to fire one. Uh, it didn't work. It exploded and uh, did the gunner, as, as they said, considerable injury. I'd say it, I'd say it did all right. So that was, that was the first use of, of this type of mobile artillery uh, in Ireland. So really, field artillery lapsed until uh, Dave, after Gustavus's time, until revived by the great Prussian leader Frederick the Great in the mid-18th century. Uh, and it soon came into universal use. Light guns towed on limbers behind a team of horses, with some of the gunners mounted and others riding on the limber. And uh, they were used right up to the First World War. In Ireland in 1798, uh, artillery superiority was one of the factors behind the government's victory over the rebels. Light guns were mounted on galloper carriages, like this one here, the trails of which were adapted so that they could be used like the shafts of a cart. The curricle guns are mentioned in 1798, but they appear, in fact, to have been gallopers like this reconstruction uh, here. Um, Thomas Robinson's well-known picture of the Battle of Ballina Hinch seems in, in County Down, seems to show another gun which gave Lake, General Lake, the uh, loyalist commander, artillery dominance. This is a six-pounder, two of which served by the gunners of the Royal Irish Artillery accompanied each of Lake's infantry battalions. General Lake said in his Vinegar Hill dispatch following his success in Wexford, We cannot say too much in favour of Captain Bloomfield of the British Horse Artillery and Captain Thornhill of the Royal Irish Flying Artillery. So that looks like they were gallopers that uh, Captain Thornhill had anyway. Now let's say just something about how guns were manufactured. The first guns were smith made by blacksmiths by the simple process of lashing strips of iron very tightly together around a frame to form a barrel and then slipping numerous white hot iron rings down along the barrel which when they cooled wedged the iron rods together. Basically this was the same method as was used for making a wooden cask, hence the term barrel or gun barrel, same word. The breech was a separate addition and the earliest guns, and you can see some of them in the National Museum, were breech loaders. Uh, they, you loaded them at the back of the gun so to speak. Now the early powder wasn't very good and it was weak 
and the breaches were able to take the bang. But when powder quality improved, the breaches were no longer able to take the bang. And from then on, they gave up loading at the breach and they had uh, they, the guns were loaded from the muzzle down. And we're all familiar with guns like that. You'll see the breech loading guns, it's very small guns indeed, but they're cannon, in the National uh, Museum and none of them have any breeches. You've just as a slot where the breech was, so you can take it that the breech blew on all of them uh, at some at some at some stage or other. So, um, so so with the improvement in powder, uh, that uh, that meant that the muzzle loading guns became the order of the day. The new development was to cast guns cast guns from a clay mold into which a core was inserted which permitted the casting process to allow uh, for the hollow barrel. Bronze guns were cast in France as early as 1460, and by 1543, iron guns were being cast in England. Now, uh, uh, iron is much stronger than bronze, and so the strength of iron guns brought the iron ball, as distinct from a, a shaped stone ball, uh, into use. However, moulding did not provide a smooth interior finish. So the practice developed of casting the gun as a solid piece of metal and then boring out the barrel. And that's the operation that's going on in the picture here. This operation created a precision weapon. But throughout our period, all cannon were smooth bore. That is to say, without any rifling in the barrel which, when it was introduced, would, in the 19th century, transform artillery by radically improving its range and accuracy, coupled with the use of steel and, uh, and uh, encased, uh, encased uh, uh, ammunition. Where were guns manufactured? Initially, guns were manufactured by cannon founders, private gun contractors, who supplied them to rulers and other customers. In England, for example, manufacturing often ran in families, such as the Johnsons of Sussex and the Browns of Kent. Significant location because very high-class iron was produced in Kent. The Browns of Kent supplied Queen Elizabeth, they supplied the Stuarts, they supplied the English Parliament, they supplied the English and Dutch East India companies, they supplied the city of Derry in Ireland, they supplied the Irish government, and numerous other satisfied customers. Cannon were cast in Ireland in at least two locations in the early 17th century. The first foundry was the Earl of Cork's foundry at Capoquin, County Warford, where he had an extensive ironworks uh, using charcoal from the forests of Munster, which he had become the owner of, and which he systematically stripped, uh, I mean of timber, and uh, it, it cast medium caliber weapons for the forts of Cork and Waterford. Uh, the second one was at Ballinakill uh, in, uh, in County Leash, and uh, there Sir Thomas Ridgway cast 10 minions in 1633. And uh, Lord Deputy Wentworth, the very efficient head of the Irish government, said they were the smoothest and with the closest grain that I ever saw. So that was good praise for the guns. Uh, but the gunfowders that made them were brought in from Liege uh, in Flanders. During the Confederate Wars, some of the armies, including the Linster Army, campaigned with trains of artillery. That's to say it was the Confederate Army in Linster. The Confederates' guns came from existing stocks in Ireland, ships' guns that they reused, and guns imported from France and Spain. But at least some of their guns were manufactured in Ireland, such as one described as the masterpiece, which is employed in the siege of Castle Coote in County Roscommon. Gun carriages, but no guns, were made in Ireland for the Jacobite War where after 1689, the large Williamite train was Dutch and the smaller Jacobite train was largely French 
and effectively managed by a succession of skilled uh, French uh, artillerists. But in the main, guns for Ireland uh, were manufactured uh, in England. Now, serving a gun. A good rate of fire was about one shot every three minutes, with periodic pauses to allow the guns to cool, during which water was poured down the barrel and wet sheepskins were laid on the breech. After each shot, to assist the cooling process and quench any embers of flame uh, that were down the barrel, a gunner dipped a sponge in water and scoured the chamber with it. To reload, a ladle was filled with powder, about a, the amount was about a third the weight of the ball, so for a six pound ball, uh, um, uh, about two thirds the weight of the ball, uh, you use four pounds of powder and so on. Um, and so they, they, they filled the, the pot with powder from a sack of powder and then shoved the powder down the barrel uh, the, into the chamber and compressed it with a ramrod. Then a wad of turf, straw, rushes, earth, dung, whatever was inserted and rammed home and then finally followed by the ball. Now, when you were packing the gun with the powder, it was jolly important that the guy that was sponging it out had got rid of all the sparks, because otherwise poof, the uh, powder would ignite. And uh, if you were in, you know, uh, pushing the powder down, you lost your hand. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the gun was then aligned by using crowbars to lever it into position. To fire, the gunner primed a vent in the breech with powder from his flask, which he then ignited by the application of a glowing match attached to a linstock. A linstock was a pole surmounted by a distinctive two-branch clamp that held the match, and you could take the linstock and, for safety, plant it, you know, a couple of yards back away from all the powder and things that it might ignite. And then when the time come to fire, you took your linstock and you applied gingerly and standing well to the side, you applied it to the touch hole where you had put some powder, I should have said, and that ignited the powder. The flash went down through the touch hole into the large powder flower. Bang, the gun fired, you hoped, and uh, it jumped back. Uh, a meter or more uh, uh, with the recoil. So it was a good idea not to stand directly uh, behind it. And then the gunners reloaded and positioned and so on. And about every 30 rounds or so, the barrel was scraped out with an instrument called a worm. It's the bottom one there uh, in the picture uh, to remove the crusted ash deposits. So a well cast gun had about 1,200 shots in it. By then, the barrel would have corroded and the gun was likely to explode. Now, if it wasn't all that well cast, it might explode a bit earlier. And that was bad news, clearly, for the, uh, for the gunners. You never knew when it, was gonna, when it was going to burst. So the thing was, you stopped using it when you felt you were nearing the limit, unless you had, uh, oh, sorry, reason to move on. What did they fire? Shaped stones, solid iron balls, especially after iron came into the manufacture of guns. Chain shot, this was balls linked by a chain. They were particularly useful at sea for smashing rigging. Bombs, which are hollow balls packed with explosives, specially used in mortars and in howitzers. Case shot in various forms. This was a bag or a container filled with musket balls or other small projectiles. And so it was a particularly good anti-personnel weapon when fired at infantry or cavalry. It was like a, you turned your cannon into something like a massive shotgun. Um, so that's that. And then the gunners. Well, um, the, uh, in England, uh, the provision of and uh, the organization and provision of artillery was the responsibility of a separate government department called the Board of Ordnance. Uh, it had its own master general and it was completely separate from the army. This division was common throughout contemporary Europe, except in France 
where control over the land forces was exercised by the very powerful uh, and dominant personality of the Marquis de Louvois, who was the war minister. So he ensured that in France, the office of Grand Master of Artillery was largely honorific because he liked to control everything. Ireland had its own ordnance board, but from 1674, the body was subordinate to its English counterpart, on whom it was dependent for weapons, ammunition, and key personnel. So, and if you, a war came and you wanted to move your artillery, a train in England or Ireland had to be formed. You know, there wasn't one in existence. And this was done by recruiting largely civilian personnel and carts and so on from civil society. And the, its organization was very haphazard. And in general, the people involved were, you know, unsuitable for the rather dangerous and skillful uh, science uh, of artillery. So after 1715, the English formed permanent artillery units and the Royal Artillery Regiment was established in 1721. In fact, a number of regiments, uh, but it gets that sort of organization then. The Irish Regiment uh, the, of the Royal Irish Artillery, a separate institution, was established in 1756. And the, this is a rather rare illustration of a matras, a gunnery uh, soldier, from the Royal Irish Artillery in the 18th century. So it was, although the army in Ireland was part of the English army, the actually the Royal Irish Artillery in the 18th century, the Royal Irish Artillery was a separate institution. But after the Act of Union in 1800, the uh, Royal Irish Artillery was absorbed into the Royal Artillery and ceased to uh, exist. This is one of the replica cannon uh, on display at the Battle of the Boyne site. Artillery was a dangerous science, and its practitioners needed to be literate and professional if they were to understand and master its manuals and intricacies. They have been called the military bourgeoisie. Ideally, two gunners and six assistants or matrosses were reckoned as necessary to serve a gun. Until the formation of the Royal Artillery, gunners often had a civilian background with additional personnel taken in then from the infantry and the army as required. An artillery train needed officers, artisans and drivers, and the support of pioneers to help move it, uh, and our fusiliers to guard it and also help move it. Serving guns was hot work, and gunners were often supplied with barrels of beer. It may be conjectured that too, that gunnery was such a hazardous business that a liberal supply of alcohol was a necessary concomitant of artillery uh, deployment. The introduction of rifled breech-loading steel artillery firing in cased rounds from the middle of the 19th century, I mean, it was introduced in the middle of the 19th century, not that the rounds were fired from there. Uh, this changed the situation once more. Fortresses, although they lingered on into the mid-20th century, became obsolete. And the only shelter from modern artillery was underground. And even that was not very effective. It is salutary that artillery fire killed more men in the First World War than did the machine guns. Well, you could call intercontinental ballistic missiles a form of artillery, I suppose. Uh, but uh, thinking more in terms of, uh, you know, field guns and so on. Today, there is some debate as to whether artillery has been superseded by air power or ICBMs. And to an extent, it has. But it remains flexible, available and comparatively cheap. It can operate in all weathers, and it provides infantry with immediately available strike power. And especially for smaller countries uh, that cannot afford expensive aircraft or missile systems, 
it remains an important uh, part of their uh, military uh, military uh, capability. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
they ideally, if you really wanted to wipe out a ship, if you could get to a situation where you were broadside and you were looking up the stern, the transom of the ship, and then let them have uh, your, your volley uh, from your guns, uh, then the cannonballs would go up the gun decks, the whole length of the ship, and cause immense destruction and casualties uh, inside, if you, could, if you could manage that. But I mean, the, the basic reason was, if I've got 64 guns and you've got 14, guess who's going to win? You know, when, we, when it comes down to it, I'm going to blow you out of the water. Uh, so that's the explanation. But they had, you know, up to three rows of guns, as well as guns on deck and so on. And as we saw with the, the Vasa and also with the Henry VIII ship, uh, uh, you know, they, in fact, they, they were top heavy and they just turned over and capsized. Mm. But the, the firepower was immense. And the number of men, you see, if, if the Victory, which is probably the biggest British uh, wooden warship that was built, I think she must have had over 100 guns. I just forget exactly. But I remember she had a crew of 850. Well, you didn't need 850 men to sail the Victory, but you needed a huge, not only to sail the Victory, you needed a huge number of men to man all these guns with six men or so uh, to each uh, to each gun. There must, there must have been sitting around most of the time, um, you know, rum, sodomy and the lash, as Nelson, Nelson put it. But a huge number of men on board to, to serve the guns, to serve the guns. Yeah, That hasn't really... I mean, I've tried to answer your question. Yeah. You referred to the uh, rifling mm. that occurred just before the end of the period of the cannons. Yeah. Now, is there, is there any evidence or records of the pitch of this rifling and did it matter? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not able to answer that, to be honest. That's. To t I, I stick to smoothbore guns. I don't know why I brought in the other because I don't know anything about them. So I'll, I'll have to pass on that. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you for all your research. But, but, but I, I'll add one thing about rifling. The, uh, in the American Civil War, which rifled guns were just coming in, and the war, they were much more effective, of course, but they were also much more expensive. And the War Department in Washington wouldn't buy them for the, for the Union Army uh, uh, for a long time because they said, oh, they're too expensive. We're not you know, to bring them in from Europe. And, but the rifle and guns were much more costly. So they didn't mind, the, you know, prolonging the war by not having the best, the best artillery. But that doesn't answer your question, I fully concede. Thank you for your researches. You're very thorough. Thank you. Yes. Harlan, you said that a 24 pounder could, an even gun could go through four feet of old. Yes. Four and a half. Four and a half. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Would you know what was the muzzle velocity of Harlan 24? Yes. Uh, I, I did know yesterday because I looked it up. <laughs> what the hell was the answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear, oh dear. Uh, no, it's just I ask you. No, that's right. Well, well, the the muzzle velocity was was immense coming out. I it it was a, I looked it up only yesterday, but it just slipped my mind now. It was something like two thousand four hundred feet a second or something. But it, of course, quickly the round ball. First of all, the thing was that uh, <clears throat> the balls tended to be rather loose because the guns were not precisely made and someone else was making the balls. So the balls had to fit down the barrel. So they usually fit down the barrel very generously. And that meant when the gun was fired, a lot of the oomph, you know, passed the ball out. It didn't drive the ball out. And if you, if you go down to the Bank of Ireland in, in Dublin, they have two carronades there. Which the, which the Bank of Ireland Yeomanry or something had in the early, uh, in the early 19th century. And carronades were made by a company in Scotland, the Caron Ironworks. But the thing was, they made the balls, well, one of the things was they made the balls as well. And they were a tight fit in the carronade. And that made those guns, uh, which are small and light and didn't have a long range, but by God, they had a terrific punch. Uh, because the balls were properly made, but I think the figure was—it was—it uh, uh, amazed me the figure, like 
two two and a half thousand feet a second or some or, sec, or something like that. It was a, a tremendous speed they came out at anyway. And uh, but then they quickly the round ball quickly lost velocity, and because it had usually wandered in the barrel, it wandered even more when it got out and was affected by the wind and, and so on. I have to ask Google the, 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 <laughs> the answer. Yes. That illustration of the machining of the mm. inside well, it's very interesting. That presumably it was using the kind of reaming because the, the, the gun was cast with a, with a hole down the middle, so to speak. Yeah. So the reaming was a sort of reaming type operation. Well, it could, yes, I wondered about that. Th those illustrations are from a, a, a French uh, manual of about gun gunnery and gun making, and I wondered. Uh, you know, could they really have bored out the whole barrel? That seemed to me very challenging. And I suspect what they did was you sort of, you know, improve uh, the, 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 the casting hole that was, that was there. But I, they, they, uh, the book I was using seemed to suggest that they actually bored out the whole barrel. But I was wondering, well, if the if if the gun is is iron, I mean, what sort of a of a weapon would you need to bore it out uh, that would be stronger uh, than the iron and and effective? So I suspect that uh, perhaps what you're saying is that they probably what they were doing was a sort of rebore on the far the fairly crude uh, um, um, passage left f f by the mould. What we call it nowadays. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Reading is not the word. Well, I'm just wondering whether it was something in the translation from the French. What sort of tool head would they use? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it must have been something mighty tough. Yeah. It's in the diagram, uh, and that's a contemporary 18th century picture that would be happening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, um, uh, I heard accounts of uh, um, of people using hot shot, taking shapes and stuff, hmm. and uh, also a grape. Is that what? Uh, well, grape and canister are much the same thing. Canister, you have the uh, maybe balls and pieces of iron in a canister, and grape, you have them in a net. But they're e effectively much the same thing. If you're if you're at the far end at the receiving end, they amount to the same thing. Bits of metal flying in all directions. Yeah, yeah. But the red hot shot was used to set. Houses on fire in cities, there's no point to it on a battlefield, but use houses on fire, set houses on fire in the city, and also to set um, uh, rigging of ships uh, on fire. Yeah, it was very good for that. And you heated the shot before, before, uh, before you fired it. Make, and presumably, I mean, if the sh shot was red hot, and then you were putting it on the barrel of the gun. <laughs> you, you, it was tricky. <laughs> you, as it slid down the barrel, you stood back before it got to the far end, and then it fired itself. I don't quite know how they got around that, but it's quite true. They did use red hot shot. Yes, they did. Yes, but all just for those purposes. All of my cattle towers that I've jumbled fired hot shot. Right. Yeah, at the riggings of ships, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, they, they, yeah, and I, they, the guns on, on the Martellos, um, uh, they were usually mounted on, uh, on uh, rails. But when the gun fired, it, the gun itself was on a, a wooden um, sort of a, a, a slide. And when the gun fired, they recall pushed it up the slide it was at an angle the slide pushed it up the slide and that allowed the gunners to reload you see because it stuck out over the parapet of the tower and then you could fairly easily get it back into the position because you were sliding downhill now the red hot shot presented difficulties there i don't know what the technique was that saved you from losing your hand the tower in Kalini mm -hmm. has an exact replica, and it gets police permission to shoot. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's hot shot. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, he's done a good restoration job there. I haven't been in it, but I believe he has. And the, uh, if you're in uh, Carlingford Castle in, uh, what is it? did I say Carlingford? I've said the wrong thing. No, right. Carrick Fergus Castle in, in Northern Ireland. Some of it is a dog's dinner, but they, the gun, the way they've mounted the guns there is quite right. You know, it's, 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 some of the guns are mounted in the manner that, that, I, that I mentioned, yeah. Bang. Bang. <laughs> the boom, yes. Well, I'd like to uh, again thank Carmen for that uh, very fascinating talk. And uh, uh, I'd ask you to show your appreciation in the usual way. Uh, could I just say that our next meeting, uh, the Heritage Society, is Monday the 7th of March, at the usual time. Uh, the speaker will be a geotechnical engineer, Finton Buggy of Rowan and O'Donovan, who will discuss mid-19th century earth pressure theories, as discussed by John Neville, who at the time was County Surveyor of Louth. Uh, he wrote a paper on the subject in, in fact, the first volume of the institution's transactions. So he's going to compare um, what John Neville understood about earth pressure theories um, with uh, later theories. So that should be quite interesting. So thank you for attending and safe home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.